Okay, <clears throat> I think we will get going. Good morning. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about um, comparing and choosing a collaboration platform. This is part of IMCCA's technology update. Um, my name uh, is Kevin Keeler. I'm part analyst and part consultant, which means I work with, and on the analyst side, I work with vendors um, around strategy um, and helping kind of tell their story. So I write lots of articles, give presentations, webinars. And then on, a con on the consulting side, I work predominantly with large organizations, helping them define their technology strategies and often assist with the implementation. So I, that blend kind of gives me the real world experience in addition to kind of what the, what the vendors want to tell you. Um, I focus on unified communications, but nowadays that involves, you know, collaboration, um, whether it's, you know, in hybrid work and room-based systems, um, as well as what I'm going to talk about, as well as, you know, AI, which is now interjected into all of these platforms. If you don't know what the Interactive Multimedia and Collaboration Communication Alliance is, you should definitely stop by the booth on this show floor and find out um, a nonprofit organization that's been around 20 plus years um, representing you know the the industry doing a bunch of things that you've seen there uh, it's free to join so if you're not a member you should definitely be one so from an AV professional perspective I mean a lot of the room based systems the the mics the cameras um, they're all tied into at the core unified communications often as a service so in the cloud and collaboration now this is the Gartner magic quadrant for um, UCAS uh, and you know the truth of the matter is uh, on the left hand side of the slide you see this is from May 2022 and then on the right hand side the most recent was June of 2023 um, you've got a lot of good choices. Uh, that's the good news. So, you know, you want to be in the leaders quadrant, which is in the upper right. And it, there hasn't been, you know, much change over the past several years. Um, you know, Microsoft, Ring Central, Zoom, Cisco, and then, you know, Google as well um, are all strong candidates, according to, to Gartner. And so I'm going to talk about you know, some of those platforms um, and talk about what are some of the distinguishing characteristics that if you, you know, are choosing or if you're confronted with connecting into one of these platforms, just understanding uh, a little bit about the similarities and the differences across the platforms. In reality now, the platforms have evolved you know, year after year and you know, feature after feature. Um, there's more similarities than there are differences. So all of these solutions you know, provide chat and meetings and project collaboration and all um, provide telephony solutions as well. And you know, regardless of which of these platforms you pick, there's gonna be a wide range of you know, whether it's personal cameras, personal microphones, uh, meeting room devices that are certified and work with the vendor's platform. So in many ways, there's almost too many choices. Um, if you look kind of, if I put on my, you know, work with organizations hat, there's so many choices now that you can't even kick the tires and do a bake off between all the options. At one point, you know, in terms of, with Microsoft Teams, there was like 218 certified USB devices, you know, that you could use, whether those were cameras or microphones, you're certainly not gonna, you know, even look at 10 different ones. So um, from the vendor perspective, and you know, this, this show is nice in that you can maybe take a look at some of them and, and, you know, narrow down the choices or even become familiar with more and more vendors, you know, entering the marketplace because especially as it applies to Microsoft Teams with the 320 million daily active users, a lot of vendors would like a part of that, you know, to be part of that ecosystem. So more and more vendors are coming in with devices that are certified on the Microsoft side. Same thing happening on, you know, the Zoom side as well. There's 
as Zoom has certainly gained a bunch of traction. All of these platforms support you know, hybrid work, so you know, the new way of working where sometimes we're working from a hotel, sometimes at home, sometimes in the meeting room, all these platforms do a great job of, of supporting that. Um, tomorrow, David Maldo and I have a session where we're talking about kind of the smart home, so this whole, you know, how does residential and commercial devices in the collaboration space, how do they overlap and work together and what are some of the things to consider there? But they all support hybrid work. And for the most part, pricing is, there's differences in the pricing models, but they're all very competitive. So, you know, before there used to be, you could do studies and you could say, oh, well, one is significantly less expensive than others. Um, right now, the competition has really made the pricing uh, be very, very competitive. And certainly, you know, that's if you're a small organization, if you're a large organization, um, these enterprise agreements are highly negotiated. And so I'm going to say pricing is more similar than different. And all of these platforms, although some will say they deliver five nines availability and some say four nines, but the truth of the matter is, um, I would say on the telephony side, on the meeting side, um, you c all of these platforms are reliable and resilient and you can really make it as reliable and resilient um, as you care to um, in terms of investing in duplicate infrastructure, whether that's two network providers or some organizations maintain two platforms just in case there's a, you know, a catastrophic failure of one platform. And we do see, you know, that occasionally happens, but it's relatively rare. And also all these platforms are similar in that they provide a mobile and a frontline worker experience. Um, certainly the vendors have done a pretty good job of providing unified communications and collaboration for knowledge workers. Um, and so because that market's kind of saturated, they are saying these frontline workers, so you know, uh, retail staff or um, housekeeping staff in uh, hotels, um, that's a huge new market for them. There's more frontline workers than there are knowledge workers. So all of these vendors have frontline and mobile um, first solutions as well. Some of the key differences is, you know, if you look at, I said all of them provide telephony solutions. Well, the truth is for Google Workspace, their suite, that has limited telephony compared to uh, everybody else. So if telephony, you know, if having a PBX is a key driver, then Google Workspace, you know, you may want to rule that out. Um, Cisco, with their WebEx product, they're unique. They're more like an Apple model where Apple provides the software and the hardware. So Cisco, you know, makes first party hardware and they do a very good job um, with that room based hardware. And of course, then they also deliver, you know, WebEx software. And interestingly enough, Cisco makes some of the best hardware that now works with Microsoft Teams rooms as well because they want part of that ecosystem. So they're happy to sell you a Cisco device that works really well with Microsoft Teams. Each of these vendors though do come from a different kind of core and you can see that. So Ring Central, for example, comes from telephony and arguably still that's their strongest. Microsoft Teams enters the market coming at it from more of a collaboration perspective. So they're arguably stronger in collaboration and maybe not quite as strong on the telephony side. Um, so, you know, the focus of where, you know, Zoom comes from meetings, although they're expanding their suite um, and keep introducing, they just introduced Zoom Docs, which are similar to Google Docs, um, but with some ad interesting other features. So, you know, they each do have other sh strengths and I think the history drives some of that. And then WebEx uh, and Teams have an option where you can just use a single number. So if you have a mobile phone, you don't need to have a corporate number and a mobile phone. Um, WebEx calls that WebEx Go and Teams calls it Teams Phone Mobile. So those are some of the, the differences, but you know, all of these are feature rich, reliable, resilient, priced about the same. Um, and you know, so 
to summarize, price is unlikely going to be a key factor, although there are some use cases that maybe one is better than another. Um, as I said, Ring Central and Cisco both you know, have had strong histories in the phone side, so they can provide great phone systems. Um, and there's still a lot of, especially in the telephony side, there's more people not using a cloud-based telephony. So there's over 400 million uh, seats that are, you know, just still could be migrated to the cloud. Um, and I think that's important to, you know, not everybody's using Zoom phone or Teams phone or WebEx phone. Um, Zoom is still doing a great job for business to consumer. I think through the pandemic, lots of schooling, lots of meetings, lots of family re, you know, interaction um, happened on Zoom. And so it's a little simpler in terms of just, you know, if you're a business and want to do business to consumer, um, Zoom, the consumers are much more familiar with how it works just because of previous experience for many of them. And, uh, you know, Zoom and Cisco WebEx, if you have you're working with third-party contractors, external people to your organization. Um, it's easier to set up like a Zoom chat or a WebEx team and that has both external participants. Um, Microsoft is very strong on the security side, um, but some of that security makes it more difficult to have guest users participate in, let's say, a Microsoft Teams channel that involves it's not that you can't do it, it's just that it's a little more complicated than with Zoom and Cisco WebEx. But the thing is, is the Microsoft has this strong competitive advantage is that for many larger organizations, they're already Microsoft shops. So to some degree, the, the Microsoft Office bundle was the ultimate Trojan horse. They would say to organizations, hey, Teams is free because it comes with this bundle and that really drove, you know, now they have 320 million monthly active users. So of the 400 million commercial office accounts, people paying for office, the businesses, 320 million of those um, are regular Teams users because the, hey, you might as well try it, it comes for free, that really worked well. And then organizations tried it. And then many have expanded so that, you know, Teams has become their sole voice system, as well as their meeting platform, as well as their collaboration platform. Um, I think it's interesting in the AV space, I think there's some negativity around um, Microsoft and some of that is well earned. Um, but you know, in the past, I'm gonna say five years, uh, certainly Microsoft has gotten a lot better at running high fidelity, high quality you know, video and audio meetings. So if you have a kind of a negative view of Teams as compared to, let's say, WebEx or Zoom, um, I'm not saying Teams is better, but you probably, with all these platforms, um, should take a look because if you're an AV professional, you're probably going to work with organizations that have standardized on the, the Microsoft platform, so to be familiar with it. Uh, you know, it's interesting though, um, Google Workspace really also offers a, a, a potential alternative to this Microsoft Office suite. And I think Google's done a good job of seeding academic organizations. And so a lot of um, people coming through high school and college now have been exposed to the Google suite. And so they have 8 million paying customers. So a lot of it's, you know, free. You can use Gmail for free. There's 1.8 billion Gmail users. So they've got a lot of users um, and they're trying to build out kind of on the corporate side uh, this, this Google, um, you know, workspace. So certainly I expect that to be growing. I think the problem with Google is because a lot of times you used it for free because you're being served up ads um, and they were using, you know, they're kind of skimming your email to figure out the ads that they're going to serve you. In the corporate space, I think they have to work extra hard to build up that trust and there's still, I think, questions around 
privacy and data residency that large companies um, need to feel more comfortable with. And I think up until now, you know, organizations trust Microsoft, um, they trust Cisco, because they talk a lot about security. Um, Zoom took a few hits where they weren't trusted and you, know, you could get into Zoom meetings, um, but they've really upped their kind of security and privacy game. Uh, Google, I think, is still working on that. But you know, one of the key differentiators, because all the features, all these platforms, they keep adding features, and yeah, there's a big giant list, and they still come out with a new feature. Um, a lot of times they'll come out with a new feature, and they make a big deal about it, but if you look at another platform, they've had it for a while. So for instance, you know, Teams came out with voice isolation for noise reduction, this idea that it eliminates not only background noises, but any voice that isn't your voice. You train it on your voice. And they made big fanfare. They showed it off at Enterprise Connect in a demo. They went to the show floor and tried to, you know, the person, the vice president that heads up the devices, Elia, showed it on a noisy, um, you know, trade floor with people in the background, and he talked and said, isn't this amazing that AI can, you know, do this voice isolation? Um, it, it was amazing, it's a nice feature, but like Cisco's had that feature for a very long time. And so, you know, now pretty much everybody has caught up, but a key differentiator that all of the platforms are really bringing is, you know, artificial intelligence, because this has a real chance of being able to, uh, you know, speed up your work, deliver more time back to you, especially on some repetitive tasks. Uh, the session this morning, which, did a deep dive on AI. You know, all of these platforms have been using what I call the behind the scenes AI um, to do noise cancellation, background blur, all of those kinds of things. Most are providing, you know, the real time captioning or real time translation, which is also AI. Um, but they're now bringing the ability to summarize meetings or summarize a call. Of course, to do that, you have to turn on the transcript of the you know, call, you have to get into the habit of either, well, both recording and creating a transcript. And I think a lot of people aren't, you know, that's not a habit for them or, you know, for internal meetings, you know, you need to talk in your group and say, hey, we're gonna record all these meetings. Is everybody comfortable with that, right? Um, that can save some real time in terms of not needing to take notes or, you know, send out minutes or remember all the action items. Um, and there really is, as part of these collaboration platforms, generative AI gives you this real opportunity to drive some real productivity, whether it's summarize, you know, the last month's emails that I exchanged and pull out the key points, or summarize this lengthy chat, you know, conversation. Um, chats are great, but, you know, group chats can become long and unwieldy, and, you know, you have months, or you're a new team member and you're like, oh man, you know, you can now ask generative AI to just summarize the key points from this particular chat. And, you know, but generative AI, it's the reason that this is going to be a key differentiator is it works best when it has access to the most amount of context, which means in a corporate setting, the generative AI is really gonna drive you to want a single solution. So while I said, you know, Zoom might be a great business to consumer meeting platform. Well, let's say you use WebEx internally or Teams internal for internal meetings, and then I use Zoom for business to consumer because consumers find that a little bit easier. The problem there is now I've got meeting data in two separate places, and theoretically, I now would use the Zoom AI companion for part and Teams Copilot or the WebEx AI system for part. And now it's like, you know, you split your brain and you only know half of the information. So um, AI is going to further push these vendors to build out more product suites. And we're seeing that, um, you know, certainly, well, WebEx has the WebEx suite. I mean, and Google uh, is adding to their suite in Zoom with Zoom Docs and the Zoom Calendar and Zoom uh, being an email client, um, some of the reasons they're doing this is really because of, you know, the future of leveraging AI better. 
if, if we take a look at generally how these platforms deliver AI, this is kind of represents the, um, the overall positioning. And so if you look at it uh, on the horizontal axis, this is scope of the AI features. So farther to the right um, is you have more features. Um, but then there's different philosophies in terms of price. Uh, you know, higher up is a higher price. So if we, if we start, um, WebEx AI Assistant and Zoom AI Companion, those both come at no additional cost. So if you have a, a paid license, this isn't like there's free licenses for, for these as well, but these are paid kind of business licenses. Um, you can then turn on the AI Assistant or AI Companion and there's no additional licensing required. On the other hand, you have uh, Google Gemini for Workspace. Gemini is their AI assistant. Um, that's, and, and Teams with Copilot. Microsoft, of course, has come up with a million different Copilots. There's like 20 plus and counting because they make licensing as confusing as possible. But um, in a corporate setting, it's really Teams with Copilot for Microsoft 365. Both that and Google Gemini are priced at $30 per user per month. On the team side of the house, you have to sign up for an annual. So it's $30 per month, but you can't buy it just for a month and dry it out. You have to really you know, invest the $360 per user for that co-pilot for Microsoft 365. So you know, Teams kind of with co-pilot has the most AI features, when you'll see when we take a look at the detailed chart. Um, but it also arguably costs the most. So, so this chart represents, and the slides will be available um, afterwards. Um, well, I, and I don't exactly know how long. If you're desperate to get some of the, the charts or what have you, you know, you just find me on LinkedIn and uh, I, can, I can send that to you. But you know, what we're looking at here is, um, the scope of AI and you know, whether the particular, whether it's WebEx or Zoom, Microsoft Copilot or Google Gemini, um, does it provide this particular feature? So you can see that um, right now, in terms of like this, which is kind of the behind the scenes AI, this is the audio and video AI that's been in these products for a, a very long time. Um, pretty much everybody gets yeses across the board um, except for uh, speaker isolation. So training it on your voice so it can take out other voices when you're in a noisy environment. Um, you know, all of them do video filters. Some of them, you know, there's different examples of the video filters, some have more or less. But for the most part, this behind the scenes AI, all of them do a great job at this, providing great, you know, visuals and audio pretty much in, in most environments. Um, what we see in terms of things like text creation. So this is giving AI a prompt like, hey, write me a, you know, a project plan or write an article about this. Um, AI, uh, it, with the Zoom with the AI Companion and Microsoft Copilot for 365 um, and uh, Google Gemini, um, they all really have documents. In WebEx, really there isn't a place where you create documents, at least today. So. Um, you know, Zoom came out with Zoom Docs just recently, and so you can use the AI Companion, give it a prompt, and it can generate a text for you. Um, and the same thing in chat, uh, if you want to write a message, say, I want to, you know, help me write a message praising the good job my coworker did. Um, you can do that uh, in Zoom and Microsoft. So you can see some differences here. Um, WebEx really focuses more on uh, just you know, less on the document side and more on either refining chat, so help me reword this to make it longer, shorter, more persuasive, um, but not so much in terms of the creation piece. And you can see some of the features, uh, Gemini for Workspace, we've labeled as coming soon because they say they're gonna bring them out, but if you go there today, they're not available. And then if we drill down on some of the other uh, you know, here's just other things that AI and generative AI does a good job at, which is transcription. So this is taking a meeting and transcribing it. That's then how you can do 
the summarization of it. Um, and you can see things like um, WebEx does, you know, this with voicemails as does, you know, the others. Uh, so that's nice to be able to, you know, transcribe and summarize, especially if somebody leaves you a long-winded voicemail. I don't know. I, I don't ever listen to my voicemails. I, you know, it's now like you see you get a voicemail, you call the person back and say, I see that you left me a voicemail and ask them to, uh, to describe that. I mean, now, you know, with the, what's happening on the iPhone, you get that transcription, so you're more likely to, uh, to read that. And then, you know, translation, you can see there's a, a bunch of these for translation. There is some additional licensing for that, um, and we've noted it there. Uh, and then you can translate chat. So if you're in a multinational um, and a bunch of these products uh, do this, you know, so that you can, somebody's, you know, conversing in Spanish or uh, Mandarin in the same chat, you can set it so it can automatically translate, which is great if you're wa working across multiple countries with people that speak different languages. And then you can see um, in terms of summarizing documents, once again, um, you know, you can summarize chat threads, you can see uh, here, and then, you know, Microsoft right now summarizes uh, documents uh, and emails as well. Um, and so this why, you know, right now Microsoft Copilot for M365 had the highest level of features. You can see it, it gets the most kind of yeses here. But this, it's, you know, this chart keeps changing because all of the vendors are saying, hey, generative AI is a place that we can you know, stand out or at least we need to keep up. Um, and so you can kind of see this here. You know, and as I said, you know, the AI pricing philosophy is very different. It looks like, you know, um, Zoom's AI companion and, and AI assistant for WebEx, that's included. They're trying to use this and say, hey, um, we want to democratize AI. We believe that everybody deserves an AI assistant. And I think that that's a very strong message that both WebEx and Zoom are putting forth because certainly in the Microsoft world, while there's a lot of people using Microsoft, you're not going to, if you have thousands of people, there's few organizations, if any, that are gonna buy co-pilot licenses at $360 per user per year for thousands of people. It's, it's they're gonna you know, be forced to figure out which people are gonna benefit, what are the specific use cases, and then it's gonna create this dichotomy where some people have these, you know, potentially these superpowers, these generative AI in a Microsoft organization, while others don't. Now I'm sure Microsoft would like you to buy it for everybody, but you know, I work with organizations that have hundreds of thousands of users you take 100,000 and you multiply it by $360 per user, I'm gonna tell you no organization has budgeted to provide Copilot you know, for all of those users, even if they aggressively um, you know, do some kind of deal with Microsoft. Um, so certainly, you know, Microsoft is doing things like they're providing legal indemnification. I talked about that a little bit in the first session. But effectively what that means is Microsoft is saying, we're charging you for this product. So if you use this product to create content, and then if somebody sues you because they say the content that you created using Copilot um, ran afoul of some copyright or you plagiarized something, Microsoft has said, because you've paid for this, we will bear all the legal costs and we will intervene and deal with any, you know, any negative judgments from a legal perspective um, provided, you know, you've used this and there, there's certain rules like you can't go and say you're trying to plagiarize and then expect, you know, Microsoft to bail you out. But if you use it uh, according to their principles, um, they will indemnify you for that. So I, I think, you know, what it comes down to is um, you know, as I said, all of these collaboration tools, they're reliable, they're powerful, they keep adding new features, but they're robust in that regard. And so, you know, it's like, okay, how do we 
get the most out of whatever platform we're using in our organization. Because right now, there's the feature list is longer than most users are leveraging in terms of value. So there's a, you know, and you're probably not, when WebEx comes out with a new feature, you're not gonna say, hey, we're using Zoom, but we're gonna migrate everybody over to WebEx. Whatever platform most organizations have, um, they're going to, you know, stay with. And so really it's like, how do you get the most out of that? And, and you, you know, kind of, if you're an IT pro, or an AV pro, um, the features, you know, you need to keep up to date on these. And the vendors, you know, do different things in terms of either publishing roadmaps or message centers or briefings or monthly, you know, blog updates. Um, but, you know, as a professional helping your organization or other organizations leverage these features, you really need to dedicate some time to staying up to date with some of these features um, so that you're aware that they exist. A lot of times, you know, I watch people in organizations do things a very convoluted way, and it's only because they didn't know that there was an easier way to do it, and maybe there wasn't a year ago. But these features are coming out fast and furious, so certainly someone in your organization needs to be tasked with you know, staying up to date on these features. And then you really do need to take the time and make the time um, either for yourself or your team um, to, you know, train yourself on how these features work. For example, um, you know, a the Zoom AI Companion released Zoom Docs, and that has the AI features, but you have, there's configuration settings in the admin console that you have to go and be able to set up. And if you don't know how to do that, as like an IT pro, or you don't even know that they exist, um, you're not gonna turn those on for yourself or your users. So certainly, you need to make sure you're keeping up to date on the you know, behind the scenes configuration, including whatever data security, data privacy um, is applicable to your organization, or understanding the various options there so that if a customer says, Yes, but I would like to do, you know, the um, the AI that identifies, you know, who's in a room based on, you know, facial recognition. You understand what the limitations or what some of the privacy concerns, where that biometric information is stored. So you definitely need to train yourself um, to get the most out of it. But then you really need as well to focus on making sure that your end users are trained, and so. If you're part of the training organization, this isn't a one and done. And it also, um, I note there that lunch and learn training generally works best. And you know why is that is because people actually take the training. When you ask most end users, uh, they will say that they favor on-demand training. But the reason that they say that when you drill down into it and if you track how much of the on-demand training is used, it's not used. The end users say on-demand training because they're already overloaded with work. They're just gonna ignore the training. And it's easiest to ignore the on-demand training. The problem is they're doing it at their own detriment and they're doing it at the detriment of the organization, especially if you paid for, for instance, co-pilot licenses and then the people say, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna get to the training. But if they don't do the training, they're not gonna be able to leverage the, the UC tool, the collaboration piece, or the generative AI pieces um, to their own benefit. So lunch and learn training is great because you make time, a lot of times you feed them, and so it encourages people to be there. And then they can ask the questions, which they can't do of the on-demand training. And some of these features um, are complicated, and so there will be questions. So um, provide the training, in an ongoing fashion, because there's new features, you know, that come out for almost weekly. But you know, so maybe there's quarterly drop-in sessions, um, you know, where you you can provide uh, in-person lunch and learn training at different facilities. And then use the analytics. All of these tools have pretty darn good usage and adoption analytics 
at the back end. So if you don't have access to it, somebody from an admin perspective does, and they can see which of the features are being used. Um, this is important because if something's not being used, it's either a communication or change management problem, so maybe they didn't know about it because they didn't take the training, or maybe the feature, you know, they took some training, but, you know, the feature wasn't there, and now that it's there, you know, you, this is a good reminder, you may need to go back and refresh that. Um, or maybe it doesn't work in a way that's, you know, suitable, but have the conversation, but to have the right conversation, you need to look at the analytics and see if it's being used. And especially if the usage, and we see this a lot with generative AI, it's interesting at the beginning, but the usage curve goes down. And so a lot of times that means I tried it, I thought it was fun, but I didn't really integrate it into my day-to-day -day work. And so while I had it write some poems for me and a few emails and summarize a meeting or two, we didn't really make it part of our regular, you know, weekly workflow. And so if the usage is going down, um, either that's the tool isn't suitable or we weren't trained properly or we just, you know, didn't use it for long enough for it to become a positive habit. But the analytics are going to tell you and at least, you know, point you in the right direction. And then, you know, nothing better than actually asking your users. I don't know, I run a... You know, I work with IT departments that don't want to survey their users. I think that they're maybe afraid that they're not going to get good results. But the truth of the matter is, um, you know, just asking your users if these tools are working or, you know, do they need more training? Do they feel they, you know, got enough training? Um, we did a user adoption and training study a few years back. And, you know, mo the majority of people said they received inadequate training on their UC and collaboration tools. And they received inadequate ongoing training. So all these new features came out. You know, the vendors like to say, um, we introduced 450 new features last year. Well, if you did training two years ago, there's probably 900 features that, you know, users aren't gonna be aware of. And while, you know, I'm the kind of person that gets into my wife's new car and pushes all the buttons, and then she's really mad at me because I've changed settings. Um, most end users, they wake up Monday morning, they got a job to do, they're not going to the settings to see that there's a new voice isolation setting that would be beneficial to them. They're just, you know, they want to, they have too many meetings in their day, they're just getting on the call, doing the meeting, they don't know that there's, you know, better ways to present or uh, different ways to share, share content that might be more interactive. And so, you know, asking the users if they've received enough training, um, I think is a, is a very important thing. And then of course, you know, you use the analytics, you survey your users, um, you then of course want to optimize your licensing because a lot of these features, you don't get any return on investment if people aren't using, especially if you're paying for these additional additive licenses. And the additive licenses could be, you know, phone, PSTN phone calls. Um, a lot of people are just scheduling meetings. So if you're paying for that, we just work with an organization that um, 3,000 people, they were overpaying by $200,000 a year for these add-on phone licenses. So by looking at the analytics and saying, hey, your users are no longer just picking up the phone and dialing. Most of the users are scheduling meetings. And here's the thing, when you have a meeting, that doesn't use the, the PSTN. That just uses, that's over the internet. It's a voice over IP. So you're paying for something you're not using. And I think we're seeing that a lot for some of these add-on things, whether it's real-time translation, fantastic if you're using it. Um, whether it's this Gen AI, if you're you know, Microsoft Shop or Google Gemini, if you're paying $30 per user per month, um, make sure that it's being used and continues to be used um, so that you're not wasting money. And so those are some of the things, you know, in terms of making the most of your collaboration tools, and those are some of, you know, the areas where they're similar and different. As I said, AI is a big up-and-coming area. Um, and with that, I just was going to open it up for questions, if you have any questions about 
you know, any of these collaboration or UC platforms that some of the wonderful AV stuff plugs into. Questions? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the challenges is, um, it, it, it is, and, and so, you know, there's, when the equipment in the room is certified, you know, whether it's Zoom, WebEx, Teams, um, it typically works well with, you know, the, the cloud-based backend. Um, and so, most larger organizations will only look at certified devices because otherwise you've got the device trying to do noise canceling and then the cloud trying to do noise canceling and that, that generally doesn't work well. I think there needs to be, and there is you know, ongoing work to make the devices you know, do what it should, where it should. So for example, it, you know, the devices that do um, speaker identification on the device that's, people like that because there's less latency and biometric information isn't going up into the cloud and some people from a security perspective like that idea. The problem is, you know, Microsoft came out with these intelligent speakers. It would, you could train it to recognize people um, and the device would do that. And then Microsoft said, you know what, we're gonna do this in the cloud so that every device could do that and so you know, I think we're seeing the cloud vendors, you know, Cisco does voice isolation, you know, they do it in the cloud as well. So I think there's a bit of battles between, like if you look at the multi-camera setups, the device manufacturers want to do that and the cloud vendors want to do that. And the best solution is, you know, a cloud and edge solution. But I think today, um, people are trying to differentiate and they don't always work as well as you would like them to work. So I, I, I think eventually it will happen, you know, in both places because it makes sense to combine video streams on the device sometimes and sometimes it makes sense to do it in the cloud and, you know, you need to get the vendors working together but um, sometimes that takes years before they're integrated well. Any other questions? Okay, well, with that, I thank you. And once again, if you're not part of the IMCCA, go check out the booth on the show floor. I guess the show floor opens tomorrow, so can't check it out today, but check it out tomorrow then. And thank you very much. <laughs>